Okay. So I was talking about wishy-washy words, and by that, that's not, a, that's not a legal term. That's just something I call them. Words that can be interpreted many different ways and that are often purposefully used by the legislature because they want to set a standard, but they can't be too specific. They're trying to make a standard that can be read to apply to everyone. So they tend to use a lot of these words like sufficient, significant, et cetera. And I added one because Professor Yenesee said, what about proportional or proportionate? I said, that's another wishy-washy word and I added that on there. But this is not a definitive list. There are many words like this that can be used. But what I also wanna demonstrate is that a lot of times we have words that we think are clear and have a meaning that everybody is going to understand and how in certain circumstances, we could see that those particular words are not as precise or clear as we thought. So I'm going to be giving you uh, several examples that we'll go over together. Okay, so here is one. It says, no garbage dump can be established within 250 yards of a residence. I usually like to draw a little picture, but I don't really, I can't really do that right now. So I'll kind of gesture in the air and you can watch me. Okay, so let's suppose there's a garbage dump that's here and has been there since, I don't know, let's say 1950. And then somebody comes and builds a house here. Now, uh, 250 yards, I mean, we're, we're, we're talking about yards. I'm not really quite sure what that is in meters. <laughs> but let's say that this house is built here and there's, it's definitely more than 250 yards between. Okay, so the garbage dump is here, the house is here. But there's so much garbage that the garbage dump decides to expand. So it buys all this intervening land here and extends the garbage dump. So the garbage dump is right next door to the house at this point. Mm -hmm. So we have this statue here. Which word in this statue is now up for question? Anybody have any idea? No guesses. So the, the garbage dump uh, can be established within the 20, 50 yards right. of a residence, but the residence, about the residence, I'm not sure. Uh, for example, I'm a developer. May I uh, establish a residence near to a garbage dump or not? Well, you are getting right on to the correct word that becomes ambiguous here, and that is the word established. Because the garbage dump can say, look, you might remember I told you that they were established in 1950. And established is a word we often use to mean when something got started, right? A business, businesses will often say, you know, Miller Brothers Furniture established in, you know, 1846 or something, so that you're very impressed with how long that they've been around. And so, but here, does it mean that a gar you know, if there's already a residence, that a garbage cannot come and establish itself close to the residence? Or in this particular situation, can it also mean that a garbage dump is not allowed really to be within 250 yards of the residence? And I'm sure that when they wrote the statute, they were probably thinking that there was residences and the garbage dump was gonna come around and it should stay far away from the houses. But, the word established isn't necessarily clear. And so you have a situation where you think a word that everybody understands, lawyers get involved and start arguing about what established means in the particular situation. So, yeah, you. you Welcome, go. Kurt. I wanted to say something from. Okay. Are you talking about certain objections? Dr. Oh, I'm sorry. Hello. I, I, I can't hear you though. Do I need to turn uh, on the? I suppose that uh, you were asking to. Uh, uh, the... okay. I'm sorry. So. Are you? You're you're on mute, I think. Uh, do you hear me? No, going to the. Oh. Hocam, Zoom'daki sesle sorun olabilir mi? Ah. No, ah, bizim buradan çıkacak ses. Well, they have problems. 
Onlar bizim Akın ülkemizde sesle var. problem var. Uh, do you yes, hear yes. me? Doctor yeni şey. Do you hear me? Evet. <gülüyor> do you hear me? <gülüyor> so of my Turkish words I know. Asa ses yukarı geliyor. Evet, buradan buradan geldi az Buradan geliyor. Evet, buradan biz ses. sesleri duyabiliyoruz. Yanlış düğmeye basınca kardan hoparlörden geliyor. Ee, oradan geliyor hocam. Onlar sessizde değiller. Herhalde odanın ses sistemiyle alakalı. Evet. Biz onları duymuyoruz. Çünkü onlar sessizde değiller. Başka bir bilgisayardan girsek acaba duyulur mu? Siz Zoom'a sizi, sizden ses katılın mesela Zoom'a. Hemen şey yapabilirim ben. Sorry, he's trying to log in from another computer so that we could okay. hear them. Now, how do I, there's two messages, is that what that little two means? Uh, in the chat box? Yes, where is uh, the chat box? Şey, Burak, şey, sen de Zoom'a git, chat'ten bir şey varsa söyle bize. Hemen geliyorum hocam. Um, yeah. If you come out, but because it's MacBook, I'm not really. If you just come out, it's all fine. Then we're going to miss everybody. No, we can go back to that. Do I do this once? That would finish. Ali, bir konuşmayı deneyebilir misin? Alman lazım bize. Hold on a second. Sana geliyor mu ses? Hocam, sana da geliyor. Sana da geliyor. Sana da geliyor. Ya, akım eğitim alıp konuşmayı. Ya, It may go on. It's just so You're magic. You're magic. Yeah, we can see. All right. You got that. You could. You got to it. No. You says. Who says what? Mm -hmm. Ah. The word established is a problematic one because of the situation you said the garbage soup was established to infect your way, but after establishment is expanded. Perfect. Yep. So, uh, I was, uh, a brilliant uh, analysis. Uh, <laughs> so the latest debate about uh, the established uh, refers to stand or established as a new one, right? Well, that's the, that's the thing. One, argue, one side, the garbage dump lawyer is going to say, look, we were established a long time ago and we were not within 259. And so it doesn't say anything about expanding in the future. And the person with the residence who doesn't want the garbage dump next door is going to say established also includes that you cannot establish yourself now next door to me. You know, you you got to stay over there. So you're right. So it's going to be a situation where the two lawyers are arguing what what does the word establish mean? My my question was my question was oh, he's still uh, silent. I mean, he's still silent. According to this statue. Uh, Within, within the 200 yards, can we replace it with the wet portion? Sorry. Go ahead. Don't bother me. Buradan da mikrofonu kapat. I mean, um, o mesaja yazarsa, Yok. siz okuyabilirsiniz. Şey yapabiliriz. E, onun mikrofon bunu hoparlör olarak kullanabiliriz. Yani onlar sesi kapatabiliriz. <gülüyor> Yalnız <gülüyor> mikrofon açık olur. Mek kullanan birisi bize yardım edebilir mi? Ben Mek'te pek değilim. Hayatım önce hiç Mek kullanmadım. Buradan sesi kapatalım. Mikrofon açık kalsın burada. Oradan da yalnız da yalnız da yalnız da Evet. Oradan biri konuşuyor zaman bu zaman mikrofonu kapatıyor. Tek şey. Evet benim olduğum da Arkadaşlar takdim tutmadım. Onun dışında belki kabloda bir sıkıntı olabilir. Yani benim tek söyleyeceğim. Biraz oynar. Oynayayım. Sor bakalım. Hadi bir şey. It is clear that machines are already destroying us. Yes, indeed. Another version of Matrix. Yeah. They've been destroying us for a while, I think. Yeah. Yeah, they're ganging up on us. Siz toplantıya katıldınız mı? Evet toplantıyım. O mesajı yazıyorlar ya soruları yazıyorlar. Evet. Onların adı nasıl evet. okuyabilirsiniz? Tabii 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 olur. Lezli Hanım'a öyle en kötü öyle yapalım. Kötüyle de olur. Ee, tamam. <gülüyor> so we are just going to continue and then they will join via chat because we couldn't handle this. Sounds My like problem and then somebody so from the room is going to read it. Okay. Excellent. So that you don't have to go back to the chat back and forward. Okay. 
<laughs> we will do it. So does anybody put anything in the chat right now we need to uh, discuss? So Burak is going to read us the chat. Okay. If there is something. Is there anything? No. Okay. Why is there one up there then? <laughs> or to be missed by the uh, Someone wrote, I am unmuted now. Okay. All right. All right. So let's continue on with our with our, with our lesson. Okay. Now here's another one. The testator must sign the will in the presence of two witnesses. A testator is somebody who is writing a will. You know, will is like when I file, my money's going to go to, you know, my favorite brother or whatever. We call him a testator or her a testator because we used to call that document my last will and testament. Really old fashioned term. Nowadays, we usually just call it a will because there's no reason to add and testament to the description, but we still call the person who's making the will the testator. Okay. So we have the testator must sign the will in the presence of two witnesses, which sounds very straightforward. But let me give you a fact situation. Let's suppose Mr. Smith has his will. His lawyer has written it up for him and typed it out and whatever and said, okay, you need to take this home and then you need to get two witnesses and you you need to sign the, the will and the two witnesses need to sign the will and then it'll be valid. So he says, okay. So he puts the will on his dining room table and he goes and he opens the front door and he sees his two neighbors. He's got Mrs. A on one side and Mrs. B on the other side. And he says, Mrs. A and B, will you please come into my house and sign my will? I need to have two witnesses to my will. And they say, of course, we're happy to help. So they come in the house. So Mrs. A is in the dining room with Mr. Smith, and Mrs. B is in the living room hanging up her coat. And Mr. Smith signs the will, and so does Mrs. A. And then Mrs. B comes in the room, and she signs. Okay. So which, so let's say now there's somebody, there's always somebody who's unhappy that they weren't mentioned in the will. That person wants to contest the will. So you can go to court and say there's something wrong with the will. The court doesn't need to follow it. You know, give the money to me instead. So which word in this sentence is now the vague wishy-washy word? I think Alex. it's presence because in this example, you clarify that one person was just dropping their coat. And it also arises another question in the virtual world, whether if online meetings and those two persons could be considered as a present. So it's a recent, exactly. it's a recent case about Exactly. That. The person who, um, who wants to uphold the will is going to say, look, she was in the next room. She was expressly called in to sign a will. She knew what she was doing. The other guy, you know, it was all above board. Everybody knew what was happening. One person was signing. Two people were witnessing. It's just in the next room. You don't actually have to be standing, you know, next to the person when they sign. And the other person will say, uh-uh, it says in the presence. And if somebody's in another room, they're not present. And they're going to argue about the word present and what it means. So that's, uh, that's another example of a word that when the person wrote this rule, I'm sure they thought this is really well written and very strict and precise and clear. And it turned out not to be. So I'm going to talk a little bit about the what we call the canons of statutory interpretation. Okay, there's a chat. So there's a chat thing. I need new chat. So let's see what it is. Ah, oh, uh, you wrote presents. Oh yes. So he was right. answering your request. You were very right. It was presents. Okay. So I'm going to talk about the canons of statutory interpretation. Canons, does anybody know what canons means? They have rules of the, that, that are also used during the idea. They're basically rules or principles to follow, right? We also have the word canon with two ends, which was the thing you shoot in the war in the old fashioned days. Okay. So we, we have situations come up with how to read statutes and the way things are written and the way that things are worded. And so we've come up with some sort of general rules that we think about when we're trying to figure out what is meant by particular language. So I'm just going to go over some of them. 
with you just for fun. So here's an example. Ministers, actors, and carpenters cannot work in this jurisdiction without a license. Okay. What about a cobbler? A cobbler is a person who makes and fixes shoes. Okay, so can a cobbler work in this jurisdiction without a license? What do you think? Is a cobbler named in the list? No. No. So this is what we call either an exclusive list or an exhaustive list. And it means that everything that is meant on here means just the things that are meant here. So if, if you're not a minister or an actor or a carpenter, you can work in this jurisdiction without a license. Assuming there aren't different other laws that apply to, you know, cobblers. So the rule is when you have a list that names specific things and doesn't have any additional language about other people, that it's just going to apply to people that's mentioned and it has a fancy Latin little expression that goes with it. Expressio unius as exclusio alterius, which means when a statute specifies specific things, it applies only to those specific things. You do not get to expand it to things that are not included in the writing. So that's pretty straightforward. That's not usually where the problems arise. The problems arise when you have language like this. A custom certificate is required for fruits, vegetables, plants, and other things. Okay. Does it apply to a guitar? If I'm trying to import a guitar, do I need a customs certificate? Well, guitar is a thing, so it must apply, or I think it must apply if we take the wording. Anybody else got any different opinion? Uh... But if you also take the legislative intent, then we can see the fruit switch within plants like uh, similar things. Yeah. And the guitar is like a novel one. So. But it could have said other similar things. So this is, this is the problem. You have to put your finger right on the problem. So if it applies to everything, like other things, why don't you just say custom shooting is required for everything? What's the point of naming three things and then saying and other things? So the way that the law has approached this is to say, when, it, when you've listed three specific things like this and you put in other things, it is to be interpreted to mean and other similar things, other like things. They call that the principle of adjustum generis. We just say it's other like things because otherwise it would not make any sense. I mean, you could just always just add in other things and then it would come down to what is the purpose of naming three specific things if the law applies to everything. It's also an example of really poor writing. I mean, you should write to say what you mean and mean what you say and not throw in these, these sort of nonsense things that end up not really making any sense. Uh, so we'll see. Some students answered also. Um, Ali said, no, I don't think so. The meaning of the sentence is important too. And uh, Sevi, uh, other things need to be similar to the examples maybe. Yeah, right. so he agrees that other things need to be similar. And that, that is definitely the way courts have seen it. Now, sometimes it gets interesting. Okay, what do we mean by other like things? So here's another, here's one. We had, a, a, this was a real statute. It's illegal to transport obscene newspapers, letters, pictures, motion pictures, and other obscene materials. So obscene, I put the definition up here, of obscene means offensive to morality or decency, indecent, depraved, obscene language, causing uncontrolled sexual desire, abominable, disgusting, and repulsive. We actually had a case, a different case, in front of the Supreme Court once, and they were trying to um, define what obscene meant in the context of something that they were trying to ban. And one of the Supreme Court justices, I used to know which one, but I don't remember anymore. He was really famous because what he said in his opinion was, 
I don't know how to explain obscene, but I know it when I see it. <laughs> <laughs> Which I think is hilarious. But anyway, so this came up because somebody was caught at the customs trying to smuggle in obscene CDs. You know, when they used to use those CD, CDs, an old-fashioned case, obviously. And they were stopped at the border, and the customs people said, you cannot uh, uh, import a uh, transport obscene CDs. Those are other obscene materials. And so this case actually went all the way to Supreme Court. So the uh, person who was in, was trying to import the CDs was trying to say that the statute did not apply to him. And he was saying, we agree that it means other like obscene materials, but what are other like materials? He said, my materials are not like the other things up here. And what, what, do, you think, what do you think his argument was? Do we have a do we have a chat answer? No. Okay. Nobody knows what his argument is. Let's just pretend you're you're representing this guy. You're trying to get his obscene CDs into the country. I don't know what they're doing on these obscene CDs, talking dirty or something. I have no idea. But you're you're representing him, and you go in there and you want to argue that he gets to import these things. And so you need to say that it's it's not an other like thing because if it was you know because this applies to other like things and you're going to say my thing is not like those others what are you going to say? So the CD itself is not an obscene material. The the data in it is an obscene material. So. Oh, that's interesting. Okay, that's very interesting. But wouldn't you be able to make that same article about? about newspapers and letters and pictures and motion pictures. Alex? Um, maybe we can say that since they're all, I'm not sure about the motion pictures though, but they're all printed things. Mm -hmm. CD is just a material that needs another. Yes, that was exactly what his argument was. And he actually made it all the way to the Supreme Court. The lower courts below were like, the first court I think said, no, it includes the CDs. And then the appellate court said, uh, it, it doesn't. And then so it finally had to go all the way up to the Supreme Court. And the Supreme Court said, no, we think that a CD is considered other materials, even though it's uh, auditory and the other things on the list are visual. But you can see how, you know, these things get get really interesting about what, how do you interpret them and what are other like things. Take a look at this one. Martin's moving into a new apartment and he wants to bring his pet snake. The lease states, this lease prohibits dogs, cats, and other pets from the premises. So one of the things that I wonder as a, a writer is why wouldn't you just say this lease prohibits pets from the premises? Why do you say dogs, cats, and other pets, first of all? So just as a matter of being of drafting, was there a reason that they specifically said dogs, cats, and then said other pets? as opposed to just saying no pets are allowed. But the way they phrased it here, dogs, cats, and other pets, means that it has to be interpreted as meaning other like pets, right? So the question is, is a snake like a dog or a cat? I don't think so. What do you think? <laughs> I don't think so. You don't think so, why not? Um, I mean, because snake has no four legs. Or yeah, snake, <laughs> snake has no legs. Yeah. I, mean, I have no, has any of you know anybody who has a pet snake? I like a lot. I have known someone who has a pet snake. I've actually held the snake. A big old thing too. But, um, and so I do know some people, and there are people who have pets as snakes. I mean, snakes as pets. <laughs> but I, you know, I don't know the answer to this. I really, I think you could argue it both ways. I think most people, when they think of pets, immediately think of dogs and cats, you know, um, maybe guinea pigs. Do people have guinea pigs over here? Mm. Yeah. So um, I don't know. People really think immediately of snakes. So, you know, I don't know. I don't know the answer. I'm just posing the question. Here's one that actually has an answer. This came from a real case. So Martha, a widow, died, leaving a large estate, but no will. So she did not have a will signed by two witnesses or otherwise. She had no will. So she has a biological daughter born while she was married. It says she's a widow, so her husband died. She has an illegitimate daughter. Do you guys know what illegitimate means? 
So is it not recognized by the father or it, it, it's sort of illegitimate is a very old fashioned word that we I, we have, at least in the U.S., we, we now have tried to write it out of the law. But it means somebody who's born when their parents weren't married, which used to be like, really, you were discriminated against. It was horrible because you had nothing to do with it. But anyway, let's this is an old law. And it said, OK, this is we're going to see the law in a second. But anyway, so she has an illegitimate daughter. So in other words, she had a child before she was married to the husband. She has a daughter when she was with the husband. She's got an adopted son and she has a stepson. So apparently her husband has a child from another relationship. So she dies. And the inheritance statute says when an unmarried person dies intestate, intestate is a fancy word that means without a will. Okay. When an unmarried person dies intestate, the money shall be distributed equally among the children. So what word is the is the vague wishy-washy word now? Um, children. children. Yeah. What does children mean? So this is again something you would write. You say the money's going to be divided between the children. A lot of times maybe don't think about well, what do we mean by the children? You know, do we mean the legitimate children, the illegitimate children? Do we include the adopted children? Do we include the stepchildren? In in uh, California for sure. Adopted children are treated exactly the same as children that were uh, biological. So that would be resolved pretty easily. Uh, stepson, I don't know. What do you think about stepson? Do you think that would be included uh, among the children? Ready? have any thoughts about that? Yes. I mean, if the stepson is excluded, but it challenges that exclusion, and he can say that he had a really close relation, even though he's a stepson, and she took care of him like a mother, and he was an actual son to her. And I think it depends on the circumstances if there is no law for certain. Right. I mean, I know people who have stepchildren and who are stepchildren, and some of them are very, very close with their stepchildren or stepparents, and others, you know, not at all. But I also know that situation with biological children too, right? So, um, so it raises the issue of what children means. Now, in most states, a stepson would not be considered automatically to be a, a child of the family. But you're, I think you're right. Um, if you had a, if she had a very close relationship with the stepson and treated him pretty much the same as the other children, he might have a good argument that he is included in children. But it, it's just another example, really, of the fact that a word like children that you would think would be pretty straightforward can also have more than one meaning. Do we have any new chats? Uh um, for the previous question, we have an answer, I think, yeah. for the snake question. Oh, the snake. All right, let's show how the snake. Could be emotional animal, emotional support animal. <laughs> oh my gosh. Do you guys have that here? The emotional support animals? Okay, so we used to have um, rules about, uh, we, we called them seeing eye dogs. So people who were blind would have a dog that they would keep with them and they have a special kind of handle and the dog would lead them around. And then we also started having people were able to use dogs for situa other situations, like maybe they were deaf or maybe they couldn't pick things up and whatever. So the role of the, um, the dog that was um, uh, helped people with physical disabilities kind of expanded. Then people started saying, well, I don't have a physical disability, but I'm a very nervous person. And when my dog is with me, it calms me down. And so my dog is an emotional support dog. And I should be allowed to bring my emotional support dog, just like the person who's blind should be able to bring their guide dog. So, and then I think initially people said, okay, you know, if you, if you really have like maybe a letter from your psychiatrist or something that you really need to have your dog with you all the time, or more often it would arise from you wanted to move into an apartment that didn't allow dogs. And you'd say you can't discriminate against, I mean, they, they could not discriminate against a fine person with a dog, but they could say, well, we're not letting dogs in just because you feel, you know, that you need to have a dog around that's not good enough. So there's to be this whole big thing about 
what is an emotional support animal and should they be allowed and shouldn't they be allowed? And it's gotten really crazy because what people do now, in my opinion, is they have a pet and they just say it's an emotional support animal. And there's no regulations about what you have to do to make sure that your animal is a support animal. You don't have to go through any licensing requirements or anybody taking a look at the dog to see what he does other than sleep in your backpack or whatever. So there was actually a woman who was a reporter for one of the big uh, newspapers. I can't remember. It was not the New York Times, but it was some newspaper. She decided that she was going to test this out. So she started going around to different businesses with different animals saying that they were her emotional support animal. So she went into one place carrying a big tortoise, you know, a tortoise, like a giant turtle. <laughs> so like, they're like, what are you doing with that tortoise? You can't bring it in our restaurant. It's my emotional support animal. Well, people in the U.S. are always afraid of being sued because everybody's always suing each other. So their restaurant's afraid they're going to get sued for not letting somebody in with their emotions. So they go, well, OK, you can bring the tortoise in. And the people, you know, she puts the tortoise on the chair. She went to one place with a llama. Do you know what a llama is? An animal from South America. She goes with a llama on a leash and she's like, this is my emotional support animal. The article was just hilarious because... The people who work at these places, they don't really know what their rights are and who's, you know, do we have the right to refuse to let this animal in? Do we have to ask for some paperwork to show that? It, what do we do? So it's gotten completely out of hand. Everybody goes around, they want to take their dog somewhere. They say it's an emotional support dog. And the law actually says that the law actually protects the way it's written now Animals that help you with a physical disability, not an emotional one. But there's people who want to change the law. And it's just, it's so, it's really hilarious. I mean, I see sometimes, all you have to do is you go to the store and you buy a little jacket for your dog that says emotional support animal and you put it on your dog and then you walk around with it and people go, oh, it's an emotional support dog. Well, <laughs> tell you they have dogs that are trained to help people both with physical and emotional and these dogs are really smart and they're very well behaved i see somebody with some ratty little dog that's running around completely you know un undisciplined i know that ain't no support animal right if it was a support animal it would be well behaved it would you know know the appropriate things to do do you know that dogs can be trained to detect when somebody's about to have a stroke or a seizure so some people have epilepsy. I don't know what you call it in Turkish, where you, you have you have convulsions. And the dogs can detect that they're about to have one so they can tell them to sit down, you know, so they won't like thrash people. Dogs are pretty smart. But anyway, so this whole emotional support animal is a very good question, whoever brought it about. Uh, but it's it's just crazy. There's no, there's not sufficient regulation. And I think what we need to do is decide whether we're going to just allow people to bring their pets places and not have to lie about the fact that they're an emotional support animal or whether we're going to have to just have strict laws defining what kind of animals qualify and what kind of animals don't qualify. So right now it's just, it's just absolutely crazy. So I've probably gone on too long about this, but I just find it hilarious. Every time I, I'm, my husband and I are walking down the street and we see some dog in his little emotional support jacket, I say to my husband, yeah, right, that's really an emotional support animal. I don't believe it for a second. Okay, so I'm all getting off, get off my high horse, as we say. When you're doing this, we say you're on your high horse. Do you guys have that expression? Like up on my horse thinking I'm looking down on everybody. So I'm going to get off my high horse. Okay, so let's get into the next one. Okay, so here's one. Lewis wrote a will leaving everything to his girlfriend. His children are upset, and they want to contest the will. They want to say that the will is no good. The will was properly signed and witnessed by two people, like we talked about, everybody in each other's presence. There was no question about that. Um, and it listed the date as 2020. And here's what the statute says. We're trying to figure out if this is a valid will or not. The statute says a will must be signed and dated by the testator. So we know who the testator is the person writing the will. Okay, so which word in this statute is now vague? 
Does anybody else want to answer the question? <laughs> I hate to just call in the same person all the time, but if the rest of you are going to be shy, I'm not going to cold call. <laughs> okay. All right. Well, Alex, tell us. Um, David, maybe? Because David. if it's the exact date or just the day of the week or the year, if I told you to sign something, let's say I passed around a sign-up sheet or something, and I said, sign your name and date it, would you just write 2024? But I might have written only the today's 3rd January. And, and not 2024, because we all know it's 2024. Yeah, I mean, that's interesting, isn't it? Um, so the question is going to be whether that's going to be sufficiently, if that really is dated, the, you know, the girlfriend's going to say, yeah, it's dated. And the kids are going to say, no, that's not a sufficient date. And the court's going to have to decide what dated means in, in this situation. I personally think it's not going to be enough because I think one of the reasons they want the will to be dated is so they can see, uh, they can look back and they can see like if you, for example, uh, got Alzheimer's, you know, mm -hmm. Alzheimer's where you don't know what you're doing <laughs> anymore. If they find out that you signed it when you had Alzheimer's, they're going to say it wasn't a valid will because you're supposed to be in, you know, good mind and whatever. So that's one of the reasons that they want to have it dated. They want to know what like mental state or physical state you were in at the time you wrote it. And just putting a year is not enough. But I'm going getting into the reason behind the statute. And as I mentioned last time, there are different ways of looking at it and some one way is the literalist rule where you say, we look at what it says. We're not going to worry about what the legislature meant or why they put 20, you know, why they put it. We're just going to look, it says dated. Dated is commonly meant to mean, known to mean month, date, and year. And this is not it. People who have the intentional way of, of um, mm. interpretation will look at the intent behind, well, what was the intent behind the law? Why did they have the date? And does this date fulfill that? So that, again, there's there's all kinds of ways to look at things. Okay, take a look at this one. The plaintiff's buildings were damaged by the underground construction of a rapid transit system. He tried to recover from his insurance company. This is what his insurance policy said. This insurance policy does not cover damage due to earth movement, including earthquake, landslide, mud flow, Earth sinking, earth rising, or shifting. Okay, so I'm from California, which is earthquake country, by the way. So uh, very apropos for California. In California, it's really hard to get earthquake insurance because we have so many earthquakes. You can get it, but you got to pay a lot of money for it. But this case was not from California. I don't know where it was from. So this guy has insurance, but it says it doesn't cover earthquake. Landslide, mud flow, or sinking, earth rising, or shifting. Okay, so what do you think? This is, uh, he's trying to get the insurance company to pay. And of course, the insurance company is going to say that this is covered by one of these words in here earth sinking, earth rising, and landslide, mud flow. And the man who wants the money is going to say it's something different. What happened to my property is something different than what is meant by this language in the insurance policy. So what do you think? What, what, uh, what would be the argument that this insurance policy does cover his damage? It's not excluded. In other words, it's covered. Yes. I think as the policy says, um, refers to like nature cause things. Mm -hmm. And uh, what happens there is like it's some metro underground construction. That's exactly what you are. You got what this particular court said. Exactly. They said they tried to add justum generis, which is where you try to construe things to be similar to everything else in the list. And they said all of these things are natural phenomena. And this digging in the ground to build a metro system, that was not natural phenomena. So that means it was not excluded, which means that he does get to get his insurance. So. Yes. So, so they said all these other things are really natural things. And that's what happened to him is was human action of digging. Here's another one. British Petroleum 
So these are real cases the next couple. British Petroleum operated a ship that was drilling for oil in the Gulf of Mexico. So uh, British Petroleum had an on-site administrator. So they had a guy there that was supposed to be, you know, in charge of things. And he was uh, like a, an office kind of guy. He was like, you know, some kind of vice president or we say, we say somebody was a high mucky muck. That means somebody that was a big guy in the company, right? So uh, he was not like the guy that goes out there and digs himself. He was an administrator. So the administrator is there and he didn't know what he was doing. So as a result of his negligence, the ship exploded and 11 men were killed. So the government has this law, which I did not even know existed. They have a specific federal law, usually um, murder and death and torts and all that is state law. But they actually have a federal law for manslaughter of seamen. Special rule if you kill seamen, then you know, we got this special murder rule. Actually, manslaughter. Manslaughter is a lesser form of murder. Okay. Um, so, and but the statute says every captain, engineer, pilot, or other person employed by any steamship or vessel whose negligence causes the death of a seaman is guilty of manslaughter. Okay. So this guy from headquarters, he was not a captain. He was not an engineer. He was not a pilot. But he was another person employed on the steamship. But so is the janitor and the person that soaks the boiler and whatever, you know, whatever all those things are. There's all kinds of employees, right? So they were trying to figure out whether this government official could be fit within this somehow. And they said, well, we can't really interpret it to mean anybody employed on the steamship because that would just be too broad, right? The person who swaps the deck He's not, you know, he can't be held responsible. So how do you think they tried to find the commonality? So they said, what is the commonality between being a captain, an engineer, and a pilot? And if anybody else is covered, they should be a like person or a person that has sort of a commonality with these other people that are on the list. And what, how could we describe the, uh, this on-site administrator so that he is, has something in common with the captain, engineer, and pilot? Yes. Uh, so if, you, uh, if you're a captain, engineer, or pilot, your job is to run the steamboat or vessel. Mm -hmm. So uh, if you're like one of the administrators, it's not your job to uh, run it. It's your job to assist them by their running this. So what do you think then? Should the guy be, uh, be found guilty of manslaughter or not? Uh, I don't think so because it's uh, also not a seaman. I, I wouldn't call that. So. Well, the 11 men who were killed were the seamen, not the guy who, uh, not the monkey monk. Oh, okay, okay. <laughs> he lived. <laughs> he, lived he lived to see another day and commit some more negligence, probably. No, okay. So here's what the court said control over the seamen? Yes. Respo they use the word responsible, but control would work just as well. They said what they're talking about is someone who's responsible. This is kind of what you said except they came out the other way. They said he is responsible. The, the court said, basically, the captain, the engineer, and the pilot, uh, that's, those are people that are responsible, responsible being the, the word, for the operation, equipment, or navigation of the vessel. So it wouldn't apply to the janitor or the guy who stokes the boiler, but it would apply to the on-site administrator who is supposed to be there to be responsible for the running, uh, the smooth running of the operation. So they said it does cover him. But it would not cover, just because it says for other person employed on the steamship, it would not cover everybody that's employed on the steamship. So it's an, again, example of taking this really broad language that sort of says, or anybody else, <laughs> you know? What's the point of naming these people if it's also gonna include anybody else? Um, yes, we have a comment. Perdon, Jens, okay. question. Uh, captain and pilots have a bigger responsibility, but the on-site uh, administrator has not that power. Well, the court says, I mean, basically, he was he's above those guys, right? So if those guys are going to be responsible, I would think the guy that's above them is going to be responsible too, right? 
I mean, I could just, I just sort of picture this guy, you know, somebody comes out from headquarters and he's a pencil pusher and he doesn't know anything about running. And I mean, this is what I, what I picture in my mind. I don't know if this is true or not. And he probably thinks he's, you know, knows what he's doing and he's a big shot and he really doesn't know what he's doing. And as a result, tragically, people end up dying. So anyway, I, I, I'm pretty sure he was convicted. I, I, it's been a long time since I read this, 2015. Anyway, so once they decided, yes, it could apply to him, then, of course, they had to have the trial about whether he was responsible and whether he was negligent and whatever. Okay, here's one I really like. Okay, a fisherman caught a lot of fish in violation of federal law. So federal law says that you, you can only uh, fish in certain places at certain times, and also that you have to uh, have fish that are a certain size, and if they're too small, you're supposed to put them back in the water and not take them. So he caught about a, a bunch of undersized fish, fish that were, they were too small and he wasn't supposed to keep them. So he sees the feds coming. So he takes all the fish and throws it back in the water. So there's no evidence, right? The evidence is all thrown away now. So they charged him with it. Like, what, what are we going to charge him with, you know? Okay, let's charge him with, under this one. It's illegal to destroy or conceal any record, document, or tangible object with the intent to impede a federal um, uh, uh, investigation. So they're saying he destroyed or, or concealed the fish in order to impede a federal investigation, right? But it says record, document, or tangible object. Tangible means something you can touch, right? A fish is a tangible object, right? So he's saying, the government's saying, look, he, he destroyed this tangible object and we should, we should excuse me, he should be you know, guilty. He violated this law. What do you think? Is a fish like, like a record or a document? Yes. Uh, I would hope that they uh, comment it or as an end. Or what? As an end. As an end? A and D. And. So they think that the record document, documents uh, tell and tangible object. Oh, you're looking at the old or and the word. That's what you're looking at. Okay. Well, let me tell you what they said. They said a tangible object under this statute must be an object used to record or preserve information. Because this statute was actually written for people who were going to start destroying their records when the, when the feds come up, people are going to throw fish back in the sea. So they said, sorry, he's not covered by this one. Now, there was probably some, you know, they probably charged him with every law they could think of. So there's probably some law that they were able to get him for, but it was not concealing records or documents by throwing fish overboard. I really think that's hilarious. Okay. I have a strange sense of humor sometimes. I sit here and laugh at myself and everybody goes, yeah, yeah that wasn't very funny. Okay. <laughs> this is an actual Michigan statute. And I, I just put this up there to show you how Lawyers, most statutes are written by lawyers or legislate, you know, legislatures, a lot of them are lawyers, and they think they're so clever putting in, you know, all these extra words and whatever. So look at this. No one is allowed in this public park for the purpose of fishing, hunting, trapping, camping, hiking, sightseeing, motorcycling, snowmobiling, or any other outdoor recreational use or trail use. I think they forgot anything. Why don't they just say for any purpose whatsoever, or even better, no entry, <laughs> no entry. Why? So, you know, that's another thing. Don't, don't think, well, I, I need to be so precise that I need to write like every word in the dictionary and I need to get out my thesaurus. I can't even say the word. Do you know what a thesaurus is? It's a book that gives you synonyms. You know, you look up a word and it tells you all these other words to say the same thing. Just find an accurate word and put it down and don't think you're going to make yourself look better by throwing in all these other definitions. Try to say what you mean and be you know, precise. And basically, it seems to me that they are prohibiting any potential use that they could think of on the spot. And it just seems to me they should have just put no entry. I don't know why they needed to bother telling you you can't enter for anything, basically. 
That's just an example. Okay, so the lesson is to learn to be precise with your words. Unclear writing and poor drafting is what causes disputes and problems, including using excess words. And these exercises are also designed to help you uh, just think like a lawyer when you when you analyze things. Take a look at it and see, you know, is there a, is there another way this could be read? Have I put my ands and my ors and my commas and everything in place so that what I'm saying makes sense? So we're going to go on to something else. But I, is there another comment in the meantime? Uh, no, 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 no. OK. So next, I'm going to talk about the basic tool of all legal writing. We call it IRAC. OK, not IRAC like the country, but IRAC, I-R-A-C. Does anybody know what this stands for? No, 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 anybody? OK. Uh, it's the discussion part of the legal moment. Good. And what do the individual letters start stand for? Uh, Introduction part. International rubric like that. It's not introduction, it's not international. Anybody got any other ideas? Okay, what is it? It stands um, for I issue, yeah. R rule, A application, C conclusion. Exactly. Issue, rule, analysis or argument, conclusion. So when you structure a legal argument, this is the structure that you will use. You will have first the issue, it's in these orders, in this order. First the issue, then the rule, then the analysis, and then the conclusion. So we're gonna talk about this a lot more, believe me, you're gonna get sick of hearing about a problem. Now I have my own, uh, what I say, a, a little uh, added information that I put on here. This is strange. <laughs> Yes, it looks like a mathematical equation. And what I know from my classes is when I put anything up on the board having anything to do with math, all the lawyers and so law students freeze like this. Oh my gosh. It's the reason I didn't go into engineering or whatever, because I don't like math. But what I have found is if I just put IRAC students leave things out. So I'm going to explain what I mean here. So the issue is the issue. That's going to be pretty straightforward. But I've mentioned before that we, we use case law very, very extensively uh, in the US. So a lot of times when people put the rule, they, you know, they read the case, they figure out what the rule is, and they put the rule in there and they think they've done their IRAP. Okay, I have my issue, you know, is, uh, is the landlord responsible for his dog biting his, uh, you know, garage repairman? Okay, that might be the issue. And then the rule would be something like people are responsible for their dog biting somebody if they knew the dog was vicious. And then they'll go on to the analysis. But that is, you cannot go on to the analysis. You have not done with your rule. So the little E stands for explanation. So you're going to say what the rule is and you're going to explain the rule. And you're going to explain the rule by telling you what happened in one of these cases. So we have an idea, what the heck does it mean that a dog is vicious? We're going to have to have an explanation with this is a dog that barked at every single person and tried to lunge at them every time they walked by the house and went, <laughs> and we need to know, we can't just say your owner is, is liable if the dog was vicious. We, we need to know, well, what the heck does that mean that the dog is vicious? So we need to see the facts of the case. What happened? What did the dog in the case do that the court said, yes, this dog is vicious? Or was it a case when the dog says, this dog does not qualify as vicious? He really didn't do much of anything. He went out, lounged around on the front porch. And then one day he bit somebody for no reason. And there was no reason that anybody knew he was vicious before that, right? So we need to know not only the rule, but an explanation of the case that the rule came from and what were the facts of those cases. Because when we get to A, A is when we're gonna do our analysis of the law and we need to be able to say our facts with our, our client are similar to the case because this dog also snapped and barked or our case is really different because our dog just lounged around and never did anything like the dog in the case. We're going to need to do an, an analysis, and we can't do it if we just have a rule and we have no facts to deal with. So 
Another thing is when we do our IRAC, I, um, we're going to need to identify the argument and the counter argument. Like, is there an argument one way and is there an argument another way? And can we figure out what both arguments are? So that's why I have the A plus and the A minus, because it means you're going to do your analysis one way and then you're going to do what the opposite analysis would be. What is the other side going to argue? And then you're going to conclude, and the conclusion is going not going to be, I don't know, I've identified two different ways of looking at it, and so there you go, I give up, I don't know what's going to happen. No, in the conclusion, you're going to say, well, I have thought this through and analyzed it, and I really think position A is a stronger position than position B. So you're going to figure out what both arguments are, and then you're going to conclude what you think is the best solution, what you think is, you know, you can people say, well, I don't know, you know, the court might decide differently. Well, yeah, of course, but if somebody's going to you as a lawyer, they don't want you to say, we don't know if you've got a good case or not, you know, the person's not gonna hire you. They're gonna only hire you if you say, you know, I think we've got a pretty good case because of this. You need to know that we've got a chance of losing because the other argument is this. You, you need to disclose all that to the client. So you need to have thought out what is the argument one way? What is the argument the other way? And what do we think is probably the most likely and most probable and most rational thing that's going to happen? That doesn't mean that we're never going to be wrong, but we need to come to some kind of conclusion. That's why it's a C conclusion and not, I don't know. <laughs> I don't know. So let's see here. So it's going to be issue and the RE rule including explaining the rule with relevant statutes and cases. A rule just in a vacuum all by itself is really not very helpful because we need to see examples of what the court meant, what did the court do, so that we can then compare it to what happened with, with our particular dog and our particular dog owner and our particular victim and the dog's behavior and whatever else it is that's important. And then we're gonna do the A plus and A minus, which is analysis of both sides. You know, our facts are similar to what the dog in this case did in that our dog did this. On the other hand, our dog did not do that, which this dog in the case did. And then you're going to have your conclusion. Therefore, it seems pretty likely that our guy's going to be found liable because, you know, his dog is more like the dog in case A than case B, whatever it is. So we're going to, um, I'm going to start with something kind of a little silly exercise, but I, I like this exercise, so I'm going to do it. It's to really illustrate to you how the way we talk about issues as non-lawyers is so completely different than our approach as lawyers. When somebody asks you a question, as you know, just a, as a non-lawyer, somebody says, hey, do you want to go out to dinner tonight? You're going to say yes or no. That's not what you're going to do if you're a lawyer. You've got to the issue is, shall I go to dinner? Well, my rule is, I only go to dinner on work nights if I'm going to be home by nine or whatever your rule is, right? And you're going to tell your person the rule and they're going to say, yeah, okay, fine, just tell me whether you're going to dinner or not. Wait a minute, now I need to analyze whether I will be home at nine or I won't be home at nine. So I'm going to do this with a, a, a movie. So it's a kid's movie, Beauty and the Beast. Has anybody seen Beauty and the Beast? So I'm just gonna I'm gonna describe it in case some of you haven't seen it. So Beauty and the Beast, very old fashioned, um, uh, you know, tale, fairy tale, whatever you want to call it. This hundreds of years old. So basically, an arrogant prince is turned into a hideous beast, and he has to stay that way until he learns love and compassion. But there's a beautiful young woman who ends up meeting him, and he's very beastly to her at first because he's a beast. But eventually he wins her love and he turns back into a prince. This is the story. But first there are adventures with wolves and angry villagers and knife fights and all kinds of other stuff in between the beginning and the end of the movie. So let's suppose, so I'm gonna do Beauty and the Beast Iraq. Let's suppose I have a little niece named Julie and one of my friends says, hey, I'd like to take your, your little niece with me to go see Beauty and the Beast. Is that okay with you? Let's say I'm babysitting, so I'm responsible. So I go, I don't say yes or no. Yes, she can go to the movie with you. No, she can't, which is what you would expect. I instead say, my rule 
is that Julie can only go to a movie that has a strong female character. So the person says, yeah, okay, is she going to the movie with me or not? Wait a minute, I can't just tell you the rule. I've got to explain the rule and apply it. So uh, I say, you know, at some point she's strong. She's very independent thinker. She reads a lot of books. She's very intelligent and she continues to read and improve her education, even though the villagers make fun of her. She stands up for what's right. So yeah, she's kind of a strong female character, right? On the other hand, she also has these moments where she's a weak female character. She, she cries several times. She needs to be rescued a couple times. And I say, so, okay. So my friend's like, yeah, okay. Is she going to the movie with me or not? I'm like, well, I'm not through with my IRAC, right? I'm not the real person who's gonna say yes or no. I haven't finished my IRAC yet. So then I'm gonna say something like, well, the movie features a woman character that's strong more often than she's weak. So yeah, I guess that really features a strong woman character. So yes, she can go see the movie. Okay. This is IRAC. This is what we need to learn to do in our legal writing that we don't do in everyday life. And every day we're so anxious to answer the question that we don't wanna go through the analysis or we assume that the person who's reading, let's say this is written down, who's going to read our analysis already knows, you know, all of this. We don't need to really explain it all. But when you're doing an IRAC, you do. You've got to say what the issue is. You've got to say what the rule is. And then you've got to go through this whole explanation of what the rule is and how it works with your facts and what the argument is the other way before you can finally say yes or no at the very end. So I really like to do it this way, even though it's a little bit silly, because I think it really illustrates the way that doing an IRAC is different from what you would do in real life. Because as non-lawyers, what we always want to know is what's the answer? Just tell me the answer. But no, I can't tell you the answer until I've finished explaining the cases, doing the analysis, anal analyzing it the other way, and then finally I'll give you an answer. So it's, it's very different than what we do as non-lawyers, but it's what we need to learn to do as writers. No more questions so far? Okay. So that remember that the facts are important. You'll notice that I use facts. I talked about I talked about uh, her crying and her being an independent thinker and her reading the books and her you know needing to be rescued and the whole bit. So we're going to always be using the facts that were in the cases and comparing them to our facts. That's a major major part of the rack. So I'm not going to do the uh, the legal IRAC right now because we are already at 10 after 7 and it's it's going to break awkwardly if I start it right now. I don't want to do that. So you'll have to be in suspense the next time when we start doing a real IRAC. So everybody up for that? Going to see you all tomorrow night where we're going to start doing the real IRAC. Okay. So you may go. <laughs> you may go in peace. Uh, by the way, I guess I should ask if any, uh, I should ask, I should have asked if anybody has any questions where I said you could go. So now I've already told you you can go, and now I'm saying, wait a minute, you got it. Did anybody have any questions online or otherwise? Doesn't look like it, right? Well, it's 12. I think it was at 11 last time I looked. So is there any question? You hear me? I'm sorry that we can't speak to you guys. You hear me? But... Yeah. Communicate by chat. So there's nothing anybody else has anything to answer. Okay. So I, re um, I revert to I, what I said before. You are free to go. Oh, actually, there is a question. Oh, wait a minute. There's a question. We, there's a question. Uh, we couldn't understand for purpose, so maybe. <laughs> is it important to have quality pros and cons? Uh, for example, one quality pro is more important than five cons. Yes. When you when you do your balance, you may have five arguments as to why the dog is vicious, for example. But one argument that the dog is not vicious, but the one argument really outweighs the five other arguments. It would be like in real life. There's one really good reason I should do that. There's five little reasons why I shouldn't do it. And they go with the one big reason why I should. So we're not just weighing the amount or the number. We're not counting up the arguments and saying there's five arguments against and one argument and four. So I have to go the five arguments against, of course not. You're gonna be looking at the quality of the arguments, absolutely, and the and the level of importance, right? So it might be, if I do this, 
you know, I might be a little late to class, you know, I'm this might happen and that might happen and blah, blah, blah. But if I do do it, I'm going to, you know, win big and I'm going to get a million dollars and whatever. So even though I've only got one reason and I'm going to get the million dollars and I've got 10 reasons that I shouldn't do it, I'm probably going to go with the million dollars. Okay, got it? Thank you so much for your help. I really appreciate it. And I'm going to sign out. Okay. See you guys tomorrow.